Greetings, friends. It's time for Training Cafe, where we commune together with some good coffee and talk training for a little while. Today, I'm uh, going to get into blood flow restriction training. It's something that um, I've uh, read about the research for a number of years, but uh, really only started to employ myself in the last year or two. Um, and it has potential. It's not a game changer for most climbers, but it has a potential to enhance your training or um, be a source of uh, really quality training in the case of an injured climber. So we'll get to that in just a little bit, plus some of your questions. But first, the shout out for this episode, my shout out goes to you guys because it's been a brutal couple of months worldwide. And if you've been keeping it positive throughout what can be a real depressing time, if you really think about what's going on and how it's affecting our lives and all the people that have lost their lives and all the medical professionals that are up against the wall every single day, um, it, it would be easy to get really pessimistic and really depressed. And so if you're keeping it positive, if you're trying to be uh, forward thinking um, and future oriented, then my shout out is for you. Because, you know, when you face adversity, you know, I've been a climber for a long time and a lot of my life philosophy has been formed by my climbing experiences. Uh, and, you know, if you're out on a rock climb, on a big wall, on a mountain, stuff happens, unexpected things happen, storms, uh, injuries, things that alter your plans. And while you need to be realistic and you need to be data driven, you need to you know, really understand what the situation is you're in and what the consequences are potentially, um, to really be a successful person and to persevere through adversity also requires an optimistic mindset. Because the fact is, you know, if you are a pessimistic person, your imagination can run wild. Um, so whether it's business or sports or rock climbing or anything, if you are a pessimist, if you wake up in the morning and can think of reasons not to work out, not to go climbing, not to do this or that, um, you're really probably not going anywhere. You're not going to be very successful. Whereas to walk up to the base of El Capitan and look up 3,000 feet or to arrive at high camp on a mountain and need to make that summit push, you need a healthy dose of optimism to be able to, to, to make the push, to make the commitment. Um, even if there is no apparent adversity at the moment, there could be. And so, you know, I've written a lot on that kind of mental side of climbing. I, I wrote a book called Maximum Climbing about a decade ago. Um, and it's actually, I think, my favorite book, uh, probably the least read book of mine, because people mainly read about training and getting stronger. But, you know, the mental games are huge in climbing, obviously, and can, um, when well developed, be life changing outside of climbing as well. And so uh, that was kind of my favorite book to write. It's called Maximum Climbing. Check it out. So in any case, um, uh, hopefully uh, the worst is in the rearview mirror in terms of COVID-19, though, you know, there's going to be hot spots in different states and countries that continue on. And they say maybe a second wave next fall. But um, I, I continue to be more optimistic than pessimistic, despite the loss of a spring climbing season. And uh, that's why I guess I'm so happy to be meeting up with you guys here in Training Cafe twice a week, as long as we remain on this self-quarantine. Okay, so the main segment today, I want to talk maybe 15 minutes about blood flow restriction training. Now, um, I first heard of this probably 15 years ago, reading some muscle magazines here in the United States, like Muscle and Fitness or Muscle Media 2000. I remember doing some articles uh, about uh, blood flow restriction training. Uh, and they had photos of these bodybuilders with the straps around their arms and legs getting ridiculous pumps. Um, 
but they weren't doing it so much for the pump. They were doing it for the after effect of blood flow restriction training as applied by those bodybuilders. And that was hypertrophy. And that's something that the research has shown is that uh, uh, doing weight training, resistance training with BFR straps on, on a regular basis, you know, three, four days a week, following the BFR protocols, you can grow larger muscles, even though you're not moving heavy weights around. And so from the cosmetic standpoint, if you're a bodybuilder, that's a great thing. Because bodybuilders aren't concerned about absolute strength. They're trying to build bigger muscles. Now, if you're an athlete, especially in a strength to weight ratio sport like rock climbing or gymnastics or running or jumping, uh, any of those sports where it's, um, you know, kind of a relative strength uh, and not, you know, body masses tends to be a liability. Um, the blood flow restriction application is a little more questionable. Uh, certainly climbers don't want to grow bigger muscles. We want to get stronger without getting bigger muscles. And that's something you can do with the proper training program. You might put on a little mass in your upper body. If you're an untrained climber and you begin a training for a climbing program, you may grow larger forearms and a little more refined biceps and, uh, you know, stronger shoulders but not like a bodybuilder. We never want to look like a bodybuilder. In fact, if you look at the, the top climbers, you know, they still are pretty skinny dudes, um, certainly lean in terms of low percent body fat, but also they're not excessively bulky, especially in the lower body because the legs aren't the limiting constraint in climbing. So why would you want big bulky quads? Now there are genetic factors at play, but you, with a with or without those genetic factors, you wouldn't want to do anything that results in the lower body bulking up. You know, I have skinny runner legs here, which turns out to be a good thing for rock climbing. And so, uh, you know, hypertrophy is not really something we're after um, as a big time goal in rock climbing. Yeah, maybe a little bit in your forearms wouldn't hurt, but elsewhere we shouldn't be seeking larger, heavier muscles. We want to be seeking stronger more powerful muscles relative to our body weight. So when I first read those blood flow restriction articles back in the muscle mags 15 years ago, it didn't connect with me. It didn't really seem like it would be appropriate for climbers. Since then, there's been a lot of research done. Um, a, a, a American researcher, Lenicky, has done dozens of studies and published a lot of material and, um, and other researchers around the world that have uh, been compelling or convincing that uh, perhaps in the case of injury or perhaps even just as kind of a little curveball to your regular training, BFR might be uh, a worthwhile thing to do. And so that's what I kind of want to get into here today. Again, I don't think you want to get into blood flow restriction as your primary mode of training for climbing. You should be going to the climbing gym and bouldering and doing climbing specific exercises like hangboard and, and campus board, that should be your primary training for climbing. BFR being a supplement, kind of like adding a dash of this to your soup and a dash of that to your recipe. Well, BFR would be a dash of, you know, something a little different into your training for climbing program. And in the case of an injury, a finger injury, an elbow injury, a shoulder injury, then the BFR could play a much larger role in your program because blood flow restriction training, the beauty of it is you can get a great workout with very light weights. Um, and so if you've just had shoulder surgery or you have elbow tendonitis or you have an A2 pulley tweak and you really, in any of those cases, shouldn't be doing pull-ups or climbing hard or anything like that, you can put blood flow restriction straps on and do some very simple exercises like you know finger curls with a dumbbell or bicep curls um, or you know you could be creative it doesn't have to be climbing specific necessarily anything that gets you a workout and recruits the muscle fibers and gets you pumped will have will give you the beneficial after effects um, and what those beneficial after effects are there's there's a few of them i mean first of all 
when you put the BFR straps on, what you're doing is you're stopping venous return. Okay, so you have the arterial flow of oxygenated blood into your, let's say, arms. The BFR straps will slow that um, arterial flow, but should not stop it. You do not want to completely occlude the blood flow. But the venous return should be largely stopped. And so you have a bit of a traffic jam where there's more blood coming in than can get out. And so you get pumped very quickly when you do BFR training. Um, and because you are occluding the arterial flow in, um, your muscles deoxygenate more quickly than they would otherwise without the restriction straps on. And you get very hypoxic, which means even though you're lifting light weights, you fatigue the slow twitch muscle fibers quickly. Uh, you know, they're oxidative fibers. And so when the oxygen starts to run low, they fatigue out and then you start bringing in the higher threshold, the fast twitch muscle fibers get called into play. And so if you do BFR training, a set that lasts five minutes, you end up cycling through all the muscle fibers, both slow and fast. And in the process, you get a lot of metabolic byproducts pulling in the capillaries, in the exercising muscles. Because again, the venous return is slowed or did not lose a signal there. Hopefully we're still streaming here. And so, um, yeah, so that's a, a very potent signal um, in, in terms of adaptations. And so if you are injured and can't climb and can't hangboard train, you could do some basic training with BFR, things that don't provoke the injury, but yet get you uh, to recruit the muscle fibers, fatigue them, and um, uh, uh, bring about muscle failure, even though you're working with really light weights. Uh, and so uh, you could maintain some strength while you're injured and away from climbing uh, because of you, you getting fatigued in that hypoxic environment with a lot of metabolic byproducts like lactate um, and the acidosis. Uh, that helps keep up some of the biochemical adaptations that you need to in, uh, have endurance when you're climbing. Uh, and so you could maintain both strength and endurance to some degree by doing BFR while you're out for injury for say a month or two um, and presumably come back to climbing more quickly. And here's the one more beautiful thing is there's some research that, you know, when you release the straps and those metabolic byproducts and the hormones circulate through your body, um, the growth factors that are released and circulating through your body can help support healing. So let's say in the case of a shoulder injury or an elbow injury, uh, doing BFR training of just your forearms, or how about this? You put BFR straps on your legs and do some leg exercises. Now, again, you probably wouldn't want to do a lot of that because of the potential to hypertrophy your leg muscles. But by um, releasing those metabolic byproducts and the hormones and the signaling that results from doing um, a BFR workout, it can have a systemic effect. And so potentially spur on healing. You may be able to heal more quickly your elbow tendonitis, your shoulder injury, um, you know, your A2 pulley injury by doing BFR training. Kind of that cascade of chemicals that um, uh, circulates through your body. So a, a kind of in summer, uh, summary, um, if you're injured, I absolutely think you should find a way to appropriately use BFR. And it wouldn't hurt to consult a physical therapist or do a lot of good research on your own. Um, in, in the climbing world, uh, Dr. Tyler Nelson, he's a chiropractor and uh, trainer out of Salt Lake City. He is kind of the expert on BFR, uh, in my opinion, uh, when it comes to the climbing world and maybe its use in rehabbing climbing injuries. Uh, and so uh, he runs some online classes and some in-person classes that he, uh, you could you know, reach out to him and to get some expert advice from someone who knows more about this stuff than, uh, than I do. Uh, okay, so let's talk just a little bit about uh, types of questions you can do. 
um, or types of exercises you can do. And then I'll get on to some of your questions in another five or 10 minutes. Now, when it comes to the BFR straps, if you Google BFR straps, blood flow restriction on uh, amazon.com, you'll see a, a slew of devices that could range from $100 to two or $300. Some of them are pneumatic that you pump up, kind of like a blood pressure cuff, um, and can give you very precise uh, readings of the amount of pressure being applied. Um, or you have uh, kind of a dumb system, which is just a nylon and Velcro strap with some numbers on it. And I, I got these off of Amazon for uh, 25 bucks, but they work just fine. You don't need the, the high-tech um, expensive solution, unless you are that kind of person that wants to invest it. But you want to put the strap on the proximal end of your um, arm or leg so you can still bend at the elbow. Um, tightness, research has shown, um, you know, if you don't have a pneumatic device and can select the proper pressure, um, uh, if you tighten it to kind of a, a perceived pressure of seven or eight tightness out of 10. Studies have shown that most people hit it pretty good in terms of not occluding the arterial flow. You'd have to pull it to like a 10 out of 10 to, to cut off the arterial flow. But if you're at a seven or eight pressure out of 10, then you might be squeezing uh, down the arterial flow by 40% perhaps, and maybe occluding the you know, venous return uh, mostly, you know, and so that would be the ideal uh, situation. You put the straps on and then the, the protocols are you, you exercise for five minutes. Now, not necessarily five minutes continuously, um, and you're going to do it at a very low percentage of your one rep max. So let's say I could do, um, let's talk about finger rolls. Uh, maybe I could stand with hundred pound dumbbells without BFR on and do finger rolls 10 times with 100, 100 pound dumbbells, okay? BFR, you're not doing anything like that. You're talking about 20 to 40% of your one repetition max. So if my max would be 100 pound dumbbells for a few reps, I'd wanna use something like a 20 pound dumbbell and I could just do uh, dumbbell finger rolls like this. And uh, the protocols typically uh, with, well, Resistance training, they say do 30 repetitions, then rest for 30 seconds, then do 15 repetitions and rest for another 30 seconds and continue on that course until you have about five minutes of exercise. And by the end of that five minutes, you'll be pretty pumped, even though the weights used are quite light. You know, this is pretty easy. But, um, you know, five minutes of intermittent exercise with your um blood flow occluded, um, you will get hypoxic, it'll get painful, and eventually you'll have to stop exercising and take the straps off for a period of time. Um, and of course, you could do things like bicep curls. Okay, although I'm not big on the bicep curls because I don't think climbers really wanna encourage building bigger biceps. You say, why, why is that, Eric? Because you know, biceps seem to be an important muscle to climbing. Well, a big bicep blocks your ability to lock off. Okay. You know, one thing that women with you know skinny arms and smaller biceps than men can do is they can really lock off tightly. The bigger your bicep, it becomes a barrier to locking off. And so um, you want to not have beach biceps, um, bodybuilder biceps. That's not a goal of climbers. So I, I, I don't do a lot of the bicep curls because of that. I would rather do the BFR and focus more on um, the finger flexor muscles. Um, my go-to, and uh, you know, I've had in the last few years some bouts of injury or pain where I've used BFR as more of a rehab or um, uh, you know, uh, intervention to keep training and try to stay in shape during my time away from climbing specific exercise. But when I am training for climbing, um, I don't do a lot of BFR, maybe one session a week. And my go-to, my absolute favorite exercise is this. Check this out. 45-pound York barbell plates, okay, 
old free weight plates. And what they have that uh, is perfect is this rim here, which is about one pad deep. So it puts the, uh, if I can basically grip it, like it's a one pad climbing hold or crimp hold. And so let me just back up here so you can maybe see a little better. 45 pound plate in each hand, standing upright, shoulders back. And here's what I do with the straps on. I pull it up into a crimp position. See my wrist extending as it does when you, when you crimp, your wrist extends like that. And then after five or 10 seconds of that crimp position, I go to a kind of that half crimp position for five or 10 seconds. And then I go down to the open hand, um, your open extended finger position, like when you grab slopers and pockets for five or 10 seconds. And then I go right back up into the crimp position. And I just keep cycling through those three positions. And it is a wicked pump grip workout. Um, not climbing specific in the sense that, you know, you're never um, occluding blood flow for five minutes. Uh, you're not holding grip positions as long as I am here typically in climbing. Your goal in climbing is to keep blood flow moving so you can, you know, keep the oxidative system involved. So even though the grip position is specific, the way the muscles are being uh, recruited and the stress is not the most climbing specific. So again, this isn't something I would do every climbing workout. You need to climb, you need to hangboard train, you need to campus train. That's the bulk of your training for climbing program. But at the end of a strength endurance day, a strength or power endurance day where you're doing four by four bouldering, or you're doing one minute all out burns on a tread wall or on a bouldering wall, or you're doing repeaters, um, things that are strength endurance exercises that get you pumped, that train that anaerobic lactic energy system. Well then doing a little bit of this at the end of that session might be a good thing to add to the mix. And that's exactly what we do one day a week. Now you can see I'm getting kind of pumped here. And so my protocol when I'm doing the free weight plates is 90 seconds where I'm cycling through those three positions. Then I put the plates down for 30 seconds. And then I lift the plates back up and I continue to go through the, you know, cycling through those three grip positions for a minute put the plates down for 30 seconds. Then I pick them back up and go for 45 seconds, then rest 30, and then pick them up and go for 30 seconds. So it's almost about five minutes of exercise. There's some of those 30 second rests in there, just so my forearms don't explode. Um, and that is a rigorous exercise. Uh, if you're new to this, you'd wanna start with lighter weights. You could use something like a, um, a tension block. If you don't have the free weight plates, you can get two of these tension blocks, which have a nice first pad crimp. And so you could suspend some weights and do the exact same workout. And although you could train one hand at a time, I think it just, you know, posture wise, uh, efficiency wise, training both hands, being able to stand, you know, get your shoulders square, your hips square, your, your back straight, and train both hands simultaneously, I think is the best way to do it. So you can kludge together some type of a setup that allows you to kind of do something like I'm doing. And you know, the dumbbell finger rolls is fine. Um, I just think it would be better to use a more climbing specific grip than the dumbbells uh, provide or elicit. Again, if you're injured with an A2 pulley or with an elbow, well then this might be a little too rigorous. You would want to do something less stressful, but still that buildup of metabolites, um, you know, and, and just the, the biochemistry of BFR can be therapeutic and uh, potentially increase the rate of healing of your connective tissue injuries. I don't know how much 
Maybe it takes a week or two off your rehab schedule by doing BFR, but that could be a real difference maker, especially if you're a professional athlete or if you're trying to get over an injury before a trip or something like that, a week or two could be a big difference. Climbers tend to have the reverse problem. They tend to rush back in and not really do any rehab. Uh, you know, they get kind of, they get injured, get disgusted. They just stop climbing and stop training for a month and figure, well, total rest is the best thing. And while total rest can be a good thing, you know, when the injury has just occurred, when it's acute, once the healing process starts to play out and you're past that acute stage, you want to play an active role in getting an injury to heal. Um, and that involves loading the, the connective tissues, getting the muscles in shape, um, and again, getting some of this pump, these metabolic um, byproducts into the mix from BFR just may help the process along. Uh, let me see, is there anything else? So again, I would just do um, one or two exercises five minutes in duration with the straps on. Um, so you're not going to be doing hours of BFR training. Uh, if you're uh, an active climber, active at training for climbing, I would do it one or at most two days per week. Um, at the end of a workout, rest days, maybe if it was a light BFR workout, but as you'll discover when you do this, it really rocks your world the first couple times you do it. Um, and I would not do BFR within 72 hours of any performance climbing. So if you're a weekend warrior climbing Saturdays and Sundays, I would not do BFR on Thursdays because it does adversely affect um, your muscles. It digs you a pretty deep hole. And if, if you're new to BFR, it's a novel stimulus that um, will be more impactful and more fatiguing. Um, and so be careful on that. Again, I think maybe it's better for um, training blocks between trips or off-season training blocks and at times that you are injured. I'm not a big fan of wearing the straps for climbing, for hangboard training. Um, I think when you're on a hangboard, when you're on a climbing wall, you should climb um, and not have things hindering your flow, your movement, and you know something that's not going to be real world to you. Yeah, the pump happens when you're climbing in the real world, but you don't have these straps on. Um, and again, in the real world, you're trying to encourage blood flow as you climb, shaking and resting properly. And the straps, of course, prevent that from being something you would do climbing with straps on. And when you're on a hangboard, by the way, with your hands over your head, gravity is occluding your blood flow to some degree. You know, there's a reason why when you get a flesh wound, you get it above your heart to slow the bleed out. Because gravity is your friend in that situation. And so when you're hangboard training, your hands over your head, gravity is restricting blood flow to some degree. So to put straps on, you know, just seems unnecessary. And if you're keeping track of your weights, uh, doing weighted hangs and all those things, then those numbers become meaningless when you uh, start to put straps on that affects the exercise. But again, maybe in a rehab setting, you could do some very big hold, low load hangs with straps on um, as kind of a slow return to climbing after injury. Perhaps that would be okay. But again, if you're a healthy climber, I think you should hangboard train, you know, the way you normally hangboard train. Uh, to make it most effective and not get the BFR straps involved. And same thing if you're going to the climbing gym, go climb your routes, go do your workout. Don't put straps on your arms and legs um, and try to do anything fancy there. I don't think uh, it's beneficial. Yeah, you could toy around with it and see you know, what it does for you, but I'm just giving you, giving you uh, my opinion on that. Okay, so enough there, I guess. We're now um, whew, 25 minutes into the show. Let me fire through some questions here and uh, hopefully we still have a strong signal when I go down into the uh, climbing gym, um, removed from the router. I'm always concerned about losing signal, hopefully not losing my audio as happened to us a couple weeks ago. So uh, let's fire through a few questions here. Brandon asked, what about uh, blood flow restriction training for kids? 
totally unnecessary in my opinion. Kids should just come to the climbing gym and climb and should not be involved in a rigorous training program. And, you know, you know, BFR just seems over the top. Two exceptions. Um, one would be when the youth begins to go through puberty, you know, when they are becoming a man or a woman, then their body is ready for uh, more novel training uh, modalities and BFR might have a place, especially in the case of that, let's say, teenage youth climber uh, getting injured uh, in some way. Then it could be a useful a tool to stay in shape and encourage healing, just as it would be for an adult. But for kids, you know, ages 8, 10, 12, I don't think you need to be putting BFR straps onto them. doesn't seem uh, like something I would want to do. Okay, Carl asks, and this is a really good question, you know, good exercise physiology question. Um, if maximum strength, if your maximum strength correlates to better endurance, why then don't boulders have more uh, aerobic endurance? Why don't they exhibit good aerobic endurance? Boulders, if they get on a rope drought, tend to pump out pretty quickly. But yet there's this thing in exercise physiology that a stronger muscle can endure longer. So what is going on? Well, there's different types of endurance. Aerobic endurance, where there is blood flow continuing to go, like in running, or even in climbing, where your grip relax, grip relax, your, the blood is constantly circulating. So endurance in those um, cyclic, submaximal situations is more a function of the aerobic energy system. And that's not really what we're talking about when we talk about strength makes you stronger uh, or strength gives you know, higher strength gives you more strength endurance. Let's look at um, just uh, as a simple way to discuss this, um, bench pressing, okay, bench press exercise. So let's say um, my one rep maximum bench press is 150 pounds. And then I bring my son in whose one repetition bench press max is 200 pounds. So he can bench 200, I can bench 150. He is stronger at bench pressing than me, okay? If we put on 140 pounds on the bench press and we each repped out, who do you think could do more reps? 140? Well, if 150 is my max, maybe at 140 I can eke out two reps. But my son, who can do 200 for a max bench at 140, could probably knock out six or eight reps. So that's strength endurance. I'll keep talking in the hope that we have audio. Okay, I see video back. But in any case, hopefully you heard that, that that is an example of what we're talking about. Strength endurance is greater with uh, greater absolute strength. When it comes to more long-term endurance, that aerobic endurance, there's a lot more things that come into play. Efficiency of your whole muscular system, of course, the strength of your aerobic system, your stroke volume of your heart, mitochondria density, capillarity, all these things that are very important for route climbers that boulders don't develop as much. And so you put a boulder on a route, they haven't developed any of those or have much less developed those uh, aerobic system characteristics that empower you, know, you to be an effective route climber. Um, the way I like to put it though is, uh, you know, and I, when I'm training uh, individuals, I do like to say that season over season, I want to take the maximum strength up a notch, season over season, in your climbing muscles. Because in taking that maximum strength up, they're below it you can kind of figure that volume that you can backfill with proper aerobic and anaerobic endurance training. So the higher you can build the maximum strength, there's a greater potential to build your endurance system, both aerobic and anaerobic, because in climbing, they are working together, you know, hand in glove. When you're up on a route or a long boulder problem, you need the aerobic endurance system. It's helping carry you uh, it's helping drive recovery of the anaerobic system. But then there's hard moves. You're going anaerobic. You're occluding blood flow and you're you know, splitting apart glycogen and you're generating lactate and ions and getting acidity. And so those two energy systems are working together on those longer boulders and climbs. But the stronger you get, 
the more you can develop those systems upward. Um, and so you need to, you know, we talked about energy system training in a recent uh, episode. Really, climbers need to train all three energy systems, but you can't just do it all at once. There needs to be a method to the madness. And that's where program design and understanding the exercise science really comes in. Uh, Mike asks, what is the best antagonist exercise for finger extensors? The finger extensors are the muscles that allow you to open up your fingers and also help you um, uh, extend your wrist. They are antagonists to the finger flexors. And so you, climbers can get big imbalances there. They can make, you know, predispose you to uh, elbow injuries uh, long-term. And so, um, you know, there's these rubber band devices you can put on the tips of your fingers and extend. That's a great warm up for the extensors. Um, it's not particularly rigorous, but it would be a good place to start. Uh, doing reverse dumbbell curls, we talked about in a previous episode, where you go from the neutral position and up and work that top half of the range of motion, or even work slow isometrics where you hold the top position and then slowly lower it and do like 45 seconds of you know isometric to a slow eccentric i mean that can be a very um good thing for tendon health in your lateral elbow uh, and even doing some pinch block training if you use a wide pinch block um, which allows you to kind of uh, your hand by necessity gets put into that extended position that not only trains your thumb and your pinching muscles but also helps the extensor muscles and so I don't think there's a one exercise solution. I personally do all three of those that I just mentioned. Um, and typically I do those uh, like maybe one set as part of my warm up because you need to warm up your extensor muscles just as you do your flexors. And then I will typically do a couple more sets at the end of the workout. Um, next question is about uh, weighted pull ups followed by unweighted pull-ups done quickly. And yeah, that's that's an example of complex training. I wrote about complex training in my second edition of Training for Climbing like 15 years ago, and it was slow to pick up steam, but it's now uh, being incorporated by a lot of folks, and rightfully so. It's a proven training strategy. It's been done in other sports. It's where you couple a maximum weight exercise that is by you know, it's nature going to be a slow movement because you're moving a heavy load. Um, and then you immediately do a plyometric, a fast or um, stretch shortening cycle exercise that then recruits the muscles quickly. So you recruit them maximally with a high load, slow velocity exercise, and then you recruit them quickly with a much lighter load uh, but more a quick plyometric exercise. And so doing weighted pull-ups, like five reps of weighted pull-ups, then you drop the weight, and then you quickly do five reps of pull-ups as fast as you can. That would be an example of a complex, a pull-up complex. Um, one that we do frequently here is weighted hangs, like max weight hangs. And then we go right to the campus board and do a campus ladder or a campus double dyno. So again, you're coupling a, a, a strength exercise with a, a fast exercise. Um, and the one that Mike suggests here, what about doing assisted one arms? Maybe you're not strong enough to do one arms, but you can do a one arm assisted where you have one hand on a bar and one hand on a string. And you would do maybe three to five one arm assisted and then grab on with two hands and do five quick pull-ups. There would be another way to couple up more of a strength exercise with a power exercise. Now this is more of an advanced training protocol. Beginners probably don't need to go there or want to go there. You, you, you know, in, in training for climbing or training for any sport, you can't get ahead of yourselves. If you're a beginner, you can't train like the pros. In fact, if you're intermediate, you can't train like the pros. It's got to be appropriate for where you're at, your loading history, your training history, your injury history, all of those things. And so that's where proper exercise design is essential. And having a little bit of a control over your enthusiasm and your desire to get better at climbing, you know, that can lead a lot of people down the path. And I've been there of overtraining. And that's when you get injuries. Um, and actually, one of the questions here was from... Um, Greg, that's you, um, who's been training hard for the last month, 
doing a strength day, an endurance day, an antagonist day, which is a good program, but doing that endlessly for a month without a deload week has led him to the point that he has pain in both his medial and lateral epicondyl. Now, hopefully it's not deeply set in yet. Uh, and it's just the first twinges of pain that are appearing. But those first twinges of pain, you want to heed and immediately dial back your training, perhaps even take a week off, and then ask yourself what one or two exercises are most provoking it. Now, it might just be a chronic overuse. If you do anything too much too soon, let's say you're not a runner, but suddenly you get the running bug, and you go from being not a runner to running every single day for a month. You will end up with shin splints. You will end up with plantar fasciitis. You will end up with patellar tendonitis. You will have one or multiple injuries if you go from being not runner to running every single day. That is almost inevitable for most people. And the same thing is if you go from just climbing a little to climbing a lot or training a little to training every day because you're at home in quarantine, trying to burn off energy, you, uh, your connective tissues will fall behind. Um, and while the muscles might keep up, the connective tissues will not. Um, and so that's a whole other discussion we should have sometime. But if you get pain in those knobby, uh, bony areas of your elbow, that is a warning sign you must heed. And um, the, the worst things tend to be lock-off exercises, like holding lock-offs, Frenchies, weighted pull-ups, um, campus training, all of those things are hard on the medial epicondylitis. The lateral epicondylitis tends to come more from crimping. So if you're bouldering a lot or climbing a lot and doing a lot of crimping where your elbow's coming out, that tends to be one of the things that can uh, be precipitating uh, that type of injury or pain. Um, and so um, again, uh, reducing or improving your technique, doing more open hand holds and uh, developing more antagonist strength. And of course, warming up properly is essential for your connective tissues. Um, so there's a lot to discuss there, but in Greg's case, I would take a week off. Um, I would do some BFR when you get back into training um, and I would cut your workout uh, volume in half and hopefully you can work through this if it's just the very, very early stages of having some elbow pain. Um, and I guess something that we've just done in our house this week, coincidentally, is take a deload week because we've been training hard for more than a month, going through and doing basically four climbing uh, days per week here in our gym. And a lot of those days we do double workouts. Now we have a long climbing and training history. I've been doing it for 40 years. My kids have been doing it since they could walk. They both climb 514s. They're really strong. They have a lot of training under the belt. So doing two a day workouts, four days a week would be totally over the top for perhaps you or other people, but for them, it's actually what they need to do to get better at that very high level. So again, the training's got to be appropriate, but no matter who you are, you need some time off. And so just this week, we're taking a deload week. We're just doing kind of some recovery exercise and stretching and running and things like that. And then after a week off, we're going to actually do strength testing because after a week off or a, a recovery or deload week is typically when you're at your highest strength because your body's actually had a chance to catch up from all the training you've done um, in the previous weeks. And so you, you do a really good warm up and do some strength testing and you might set some PRs on like grip strength or one on pull ups or, or things like that. Um, and I guess that's about it. I've gone for woo, 44 minutes. I guess maybe it's a little bit of coffee left here. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope this pot, uh, this uh, vodcast came through, um, clean today, or hopefully at least, um, you're able to gain some useful information from it. Uh, wishing you a great weekend, hopefully some good workouts. Or if you are um, one of those people that's starting to get a little achy and you've been going at it really hard, Coach Hurst says, take the next four to seven days off and just go for some walks or runs and let your climbing muscles recover and catch up. And we will talk next Monday and get more into training for climbing. Until then, have a good one.